we're talking about the one branch of government that isn't currently on fire, the Supreme Court. Eh, give it a week. Specifically, we're taking our crowbar to the Supreme Court's Trapper Keeper and seeing what they have scheduled in their diaries for arguments in November. The first November case is the United States Fish and Wildlife Service versus the Sierra Club. In 2011, the Environmental Protection Agency proposed new rules for cooling water intake structures, which help dissipate heat from industrial processes. Thinking, let's leave boiling fish to the British restaurants, the EPA decided to send draft proposals of these new regulations to the Fish and Wildlife Services as well as the Marine Fisheries Services for a consultation. Now, those two services wrote back the potential environmental harms of that regulation, and then the EPA and those services quickly became pen pals, just passing back and forth all sorts of new proposals and the environmental concerns associated with those amendments. Finally, three years later, the EPA published the official rule with a biological opinion saying that there would be no environmental damage. Yay? It kind of feels like this is a perfect example of the system working so well that no one would click on an episode about it. So where's the drama? Well, the Sierra Club has filed a Freedom of Information Act petition to unearth the rough draft proposals and concerns that were being passed around back and forth during deliberations. That's right, they're trying to look into the deleted early drafts and deliberations between the EPA and these services. And the EPA is saying, whoa, 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 we had some really dumb ideas around 2012, 2013. Here's the agreement we agreed upon. Isn't that good enough? The actual question facing the court would make Kafka say, all right, that's a bit bureaucratic. So I'm going to translate it from legalese to English. Does the Freedom of Information Act's protection of inner service deliberative processes expand to protect documents prepared in formal inner service consultation? Basically, if the Fish and Wildlife Service sends a memo to the EPA saying, whoa, this is going to kill a bunch of fish, that would be protected from the Freedom of Information Act. But if the EPA asks the Fish and Wildlife Service, hey, is this going to kill a bunch of fish? And then that service responds, whoa, that will kill a bunch of fish. Is that protected? So now we come to the second case of November, Salinas v. Railroad Retirement Board. And I'm going to be brief in this case because it's as specific as it is boring. Salinas applied for disability in 2006 and the Railroad Retirement Board said no. He petitioned the board to reconsider his application and they said no. Then silence for the next six years until he applied for disability again in 2013 and they said yes. So now he has disability. Problem is, he now wants back pay. So he asked them to re-examine his 2006 application and they said, say it with me everyone, no. That was a final decision. The question facing the court in this case is whether the Railroad Retirement Board's denial of a request to reopen a prior benefits determination is a final decision, subject to judicial review. Oh boy, they're not all going to be Roe v. Wade. So on to the next day, Election Day, November 3rd, and wow, bold move scheduling two cases for that day. Someone thinks this is going to go off without a hitch. The first case they're hearing on November 3rd is Jones v. Mississippi. Now this is a strange case of constantly changing rules regarding the sentencing process. In 2004, Brett Jones turned 15 and celebrated that birthday by killing his granddad. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Remember, it's 2004 and he was a minor, 15 years old. Eight years later in 2012, the Supreme Court ruled that it was cruel and unusual punishment to sentence a minor to life in prison without parole. He pointed to that decision and said, see, you kind of have to let me out. My sentence was unconstitutional. And he was granted the opportunity to appeal his decision. But he was resentenced to life in prison without parole again. Because, well, you're 23 years old now. 
Of course, that's not where the story ends for Jones, because four years later, in a separate 2016 case, the Supreme Court decided, hey guys, it looks like some of you didn't really get the vibe we were sending out with our last decision four years ago. Just to be clear to everyone, that ruling needs to be applied retroactively to all sentences, except those with crimes that reflect permanent incorrigibility. Now, as you can imagine, the phrase crimes that reflect permanent incorrigibility is about to get a high school lit class level of interpretation. Then the Supreme Court said, eh, we'll see you guys in four years when we provide more updates to that decision. Oh, hey, that's 2020. So Jones saw that decision and appealed his case again, saying, just in case it wasn't clear enough last time, my sentence was, and continues to be, unconstitutional. So he appealed his case again, and again got the sentence of life in prison without parole. The controversial point in this decision was that nobody in the sentencing found that Jones was permanently incorrigible. So how, with all of that precedent, can Jones still be sentenced to life in prison without parole? Well, the exact nomenclature of that 2016 decision said crimes that reflect permanent incorrigibility. And murder, well that's probably a crime that could reflect some sort of permanent incorrigibility. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than murder. The question the court has to answer today is whether the Eighth Amendment requires the sentencing authority to make a finding that a juvenile is permanently incorrigible before imposing a sentence of life without parole. And this brings us to the afternoon case of Borden v. United States. In 2017, Charles Borden Jr., a felon, was caught with a pistol during a traffic stop. He pleaded guilty to possession of a firearm as a felon, but prosecutors were really winding up to throw the book at him. You see, he had three previous aggravated assault convictions against him, which means that he was staring down the barrel of the Armed Career Criminals Act, but unintended, which carries much steeper sentences. His defense for why this law shouldn't be applied to him is, well, it's a bit strange. Whoa, 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 one of those three assaults doesn't count because it was reckless assault and therefore doesn't qualify as violent. This is where things get weirder though, because six months after his arrest, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals said, hey everyone, just to clarify, reckless aggravated assault is a crime of violence. At this point, Borden is making the exact opposite argument from the last guy. That decision came out six months after my conviction. You can't apply it to me. The question facing the Supreme Court here is whether it's a due process violation to apply rulings made post-arrest to a sentencing. Yes, when he was simply recklessly assaulting a man, how could he have known it would later be considered a violent crime? Still, you can't change the rules halfway through the game of Monopoly just because someone looked it up and then it turns out free parking doesn't get you a bunch of cash. So now we come to a day after the election in the case of Fulton v. City of Philadelphia. Now this case, ooh, it's set up to be an epic battle printing gay rights against religious freedoms. The problem with the city of Philadelphia was that they found out two of their foster care providers were violating the city's fair practices ordinance by refusing to meet with gay couples for adoptions. The agency said that they would not change their policies, so Philadelphia stopped sending them kids. It's pretty obvious to see exactly where the problem is, but in a weird twist, the real debate here is over what question the Supreme Court should answer. The question, is the answer? Well, I guess you could say that religious liberties are in jeopardy. The first question is whether plaintiffs can only succeed by proving that the government would allow the same conduct by someone who held different religious views, or whether courts must consider other evidence that law is not neutral and generally applicable. Basically, the first approach to resolve this question is to ask where the burden of proof really lies. Do these Christians need to prove that? If it was a Muslim foster care center, they'd be held to a different standard. Or is it just enough to say that this state law is discriminatory against religion in general? 
If they have to prove specific discrimination against Christians in this case, well, it's dead in the water. So, all right, let's say it's discriminatory against religion in general. Does that inherently mean it violates the First Amendment freedom of religion? Nope. That brings us to question number two: whether Employment Division v. Smith should be revisited. Now, to go full inception and do a case analysis inside a case analysis, that's right, this episode is turning into a dirt duckin. This case took place in the 90s and had to do with a Native American who was fired for illegally smoking peyote as a part of a religious ceremony and then suing for access to unemployment. The real question here was, can the government not extend benefits to an entity if they don't abide by entry requirements for that program that could generally restrict religions? The Supreme Court held that it was totally fine for the state to prohibit the use of peyote as a sacrament. And because of that, they didn't have to pay out unemployment, despite the fact that there was religious implications to the firing. Today, the benefits being extended are, well, foster kids, and the payments associated with operating a foster facility. If the Supreme Court chooses not to revisit that 90s case, today's case is probably dead in the water. So, okay, we want this case to proceed, so let's change the precedent of that 90s case as well. We had to peel back a few layers, but we finally got to the truly dramatic question. Whether a government violates the First Amendment by conditioning a religious agency's ability to participate in the foster care system on taking actions and making statements that directly contradict the agency's religious beliefs. Oh boy, we had to follow a long and winding road to get to the real issue, but we finally made it. Cliff Notes version of this, can a state apply rules that could generally restrict religions to participants in a government program? Who knows, maybe we could celebrate the outcome of this decision with some peyote. So now to November 9th, in the case of Niz Chavez v. Barr. Now, a key measurement to keep in the back of your head for this one is 10 years. That's the provable amount of time an undocumented immigrant needs to provably be present in this country in order to avoid deportation. So an undocumented Guatemalan immigrant crosses the United States border in 2005. Can we get 10 years on the clock? The name of the game now for Niz Chavez is to run down that clock until 2015. Unfortunately for him, eight years in in 2013, he gets served by the Department of Homeland Security to show up to deportation hearings. Ooh, eight years, so close. So he shows up to the deportation hearing and seeks relief under the United Nations Convention Against Torture, and separately, withholding of removal under the Immigration and Naturalization Act. Now, to this, the immigration judge said, You sure you don't we just want to go? Oh man, that would be so much less paperwork. All right, you're gonna fight this. Darn, that never works. Well, we need to schedule a merits case on your application. Now, because our immigration system is slower than a dead tortoise, that merits case happens four gosh darn years later. So now he's been in the country 12 years. At this point, Chavez says, Gee, I'd like to change a few things in my application. Turns out I now might qualify for a complete cancellation of my deportation. Really, take your time handling this one. Sure, I'll wait another three years until 2020 to get a result. So what's the problem today? Well, it comes down to really dumb bureaucracy errors and super specific legislation. You see, Congress enacted a stop time rule that said when you initially get your summons for deportation, your clock stops. Sounds not great for Chavez because he got his summons in 2013 with only 8 years on his clock. The problem is, when he got his initial summons, it didn't have the date attached. A separate letter came about a month later specifying when his initial hearing would be held. That might sound like the opposite of groundbreaking information, but in 2018, the United States Supreme Court ruled that a notice to appear for an immigration hearing that does not include a time and a place for that hearing does not trigger the stop time rule for an individual's residency clock. 
The problem in that case was that a time and a date was never sent to the immigrant in question. Of course, the question in this case is whether, if you end up in the end getting all of the information eventually, does it at some point trigger that stop time rule? Or do you have to put it all into the same packet? It's really the legal equivalent to that scene in Office Space. Yeah, hi Bill Barr. I noticed that you didn't put your deportation notice in the right folder. You see, we're putting all the papers into one folder now. Get the memo? Hmm, I'll just send you another copy with an attached court decision. Okay, bye. This brings us to their afternoon case of Brownback v. King. Now, this case is a direct descendant of the Bivens v. Six Unknown Named Federal Officers. So buckle up for the enforcing of laws against law enforcement. Don't worry though, liberals, you can all hold your pearls slightly looser with this one because it was a white guy. Back in 2014, the FBI was staking at a gas station looking for a fugitive. Someone who matched the description showed up and was stopped. The individual resisted arrest because the officers were wearing plain clothes at the time and did not identify themselves. So he thought he was being mugged, especially after they took his wallet out of his pocket and started rifling through it looking for identification. A violent fight ensued in which the officers severely beat King to the point where he needed hospitalization. Now the cherry on top of this third pie is that after he was released from the hospital, he was immediately arrested again, this time intentionally, and charged with resisting arrest and several felony assault charges against the officers. Thinking that, gee, I feel like somewhere in this exchange my civil rights might be being violated, that man sued the two officers involved in this arrest incident. Now this is where things get really confusing. You see, if you're going to sue a federal officer for excessive force, you have three options. You can A, use the Federal Tort Claims Act, B, launch a Bivens action, or C, all of the above. This case is so confusing because the plaintiff chose all of the above and quickly started losing cases because of it. You see, the Federal Tort Law argues that, hey, these federal officers violated state laws when they assaulted me. While a Bivens action says, hey, these federal officers violated my Fourth Amendment rights when they assaulted me. He lost his federal tort law argument because the courts found that, despite the fact that the FBI task force was enforcing a state arrest warrant for a violation of a state law, by virtue of the fact that federal is a third of the FBI's name, they were acting under federal and not state actions. Michigan tort laws say that you have to prove malice if you're going to sue a federal officer. And because this was all just a zany misidentification case, the plaintiff couldn't affirmatively prove malice. So alright, that failed. We still have the Bivens action though, right? The real ace up my sleeve here. Well, that might depend on how expensive your lawyer is. That question is the subject of the Supreme Court debate today. It took me long enough to get to the points here. You see, the problem is that the Federal Tort Claims Act ends by saying that the judgment, remember that word judgment, I overemphasized it for a reason, shall constitute a complete bar to any action by the complainant against the employee of the government whose act or omission give rise to the claim. So that all seems pretty damning. I mean, the argument comes down to another Webster's Dictionary fight. In this case, what's a judgment? The FBI is arguing, oh, it's when the gavel comes down. The fat lady sung, he judged you, you lost, can't file a Bivens action. The plaintiff, on the other hand, argues that dismissals for lack of subject matter jurisdiction are not judgments on the merits and therefore do not trigger the judgment bar. The judge didn't say we didn't have a case, he just said we were trying to shove a square peg into a round hole. Well, here's the square hole, figure it out. Now last and the opposite of least, we come to the combined cases of Texas v California and California v Texas. Really feels like an extreme case of, oh what, you're gonna sue me? Well, not if I sue you first. 
Now, this is the infamous Obamacare case that could invalidate the entirety of the Affordable Care Act. It comes down to an argument I can imagine stoned accountants are just having across the country all the time. What is a tax, man? But, but like, no, what if you said a tax is zero dollars? Is that still a tax? During the Supreme Court fight to determine whether Obamacare was legal or not, it eked past the finish line because the individual mandate was ruled to be a tax. Okay. Well, the Trump tax cut set the individual mandate to zero dollars. So is it still a tax? Hey, it turns out there's a way to make liberals hate Trump's tax cuts even more. The first question the Supreme Court has to answer is whether reducing the amount specified for the individual mandate to zero renders the minimum coverage provision unconstitutional. Now, of course, rendering the minimum coverage provision unconstitutional won't suddenly sink the entirety of the Affordable Care Act ship. It certainly doesn't help, but it just opens up hole in the hull. That would just mean that you'd have to hold down the delete key for a few seconds and eliminate the minimum coverage provision from the ACA. The real sinking happens when you get to the next question. If the minimum coverage provision is unconstitutional, is it severable from the rest of the ACA? Basically, if the Affordable Care Act can't function without this now unconstitutional minimum coverage provision, the entire act would be unconstitutional. Of course, there's an incredibly simple solution to this issue. Uh, um, Congress, if you can hear me right now, if you want to save the Affordable Care Act, just at any point raise the individual mandate cost to a penny anytime between now and when that decision is published in the spring. That would render this entire multi-year lawsuit a massive waste of time. So those are the cases the Supreme Court is hearing in November. If you want me to cover any of these specific oral arguments, let me know down in the comments. Also, there's another set of debates scheduled for December, so I'll get right on summarizing those too. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello, YouTube. First, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the courts, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Now, specifically, if that whole Bivens v. 6 unnamed officers case sounded interesting to you, well, I made an entire video summarizing it here. And here is my video of the October arguments in the Supreme Court. Remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring, and give me a thumbs up if you liked what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.